Hi, uh, good afternoon to all the students. As everyone, I can see many, a lot of uh, people are here. So there are, uh, so you have uh, four standard. So I can see that uh, on my list, I have 27 of you have already attended. There are still like uh, about four haven't attended. Uh, just I think the, the, uh, the highest one is 31. Uh, so we have uh, almost all have already attended. So can you hear my voice clearly? Yeah, hi, good afternoon, Yao Ting. Hi. I, I can see that uh, the first one who uh, joined my class is actually Jiong uh, Lei. Eh? Yeah, this I, I forget to turn on the, the, the link for you. Eh? So only uh, like seven minutes before class I turn on. Eh? So, uh, okay, good afternoon, Yao Ting. So basically today, you some of you is going to share your uh, assignment, right? Present your assignments. So uh, the dates that already stated, <coughs> Uh, in the Excel form, it's basically uh, meaning that you are you'll be given priority to present on that day, lah. But let's say if you want to present earlier, it's even better because if you finish earlier, then uh, is uh, it will be even better. So, uh, but today, before we start the presentation, I will we will do a little bit lectures. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me see who is already here. And see Bun Kyung, Chai Siu Chie, Chun Wei, Han Xiang, Han Dong, Xin Shen, Jing Wen, Zui uh, Min, Ka Xing, uh, Ken Xing, Brenda Koi, uh, Lok Jing, Mei Lin, Ernest, Tiong Le, Wei Hong, Wen Yang, Wen Liang, Xi Pian, uh, Xue Wen, Yan Chang, Yao Ting, Yu Hang, Yi Si, Yong Chuan, Yu Yang has already been here. So, uh, yeah, I guess that uh, 28 of you have already been here. We're still waiting for another three. Uh, so for the first hour today, we will be discussing about our last chapters, which constitute about uh, 15 pages. Okay, for the second hour, we will start our presentation. I believe only two or three of you uh, choose to be today, uh, present today. Actually, today we have three hours. Uh, you can see uh, from my timetable, uh, we, we have three hours here. Let me check. Huh? Yeah, I have. Uh, we have a uh, three hours. So if you want to present today, it's fine. Yeah. So we have one more tutorial here. Okay. If let's say you want to use this time to present, it's okay because we already finished our tutorial. So uh, you can actually we can extend over here. So for next week also, uh, we have extend another. Another hour, yeah. So that's what uh, we plan to. Uh, or this week or next week, we can finish to present. So any question you have before we I, I start my lectures? Anything you want to ask? Because now it's already week 11. Uh, you already submit your assignment. You already done your test. So uh, for now on, after uh, today, uh, this lecture, we will mainly do the presentation and also some revisions from the past year paper. Uh, from the, for one of the group, uh, group one, I think, uh, we already started our revision uh, yeah, on Monday uh, on the past year paper. So let's, uh, without further ado, let me start uh, the present, uh, the lectures, uh, the last lectures for today. Yeah. So this is basically the last part of your computer. <clears throat> Your computer has many parts. Uh, yeah. So which what are those parts? We have a, a lot of major components of a computer. A computer is a very sophisticated uh, system which has benefits many of us in our life. Yeah. So and also uh, during our free time, leisure time, uh, you use your handphone. To online. A handphone is also one type of a computer. And also you use your tablet, and also you use your iPad, your iPhone, and also your laptop to watch movie. All those are parts of the computer. So what are those major components of a computer? Let me check who, uh, who has talked uh, something. Eh? Okay, Noah. 
So these are all the major parts in a computer. We have processor. So we have talked about this processor. The function of the processor is to uh, decode your instructions so that it knows what to do. And then inside the processor, there are a control parts. Uh, this is to give the control signal to send data from one to another places. And then we also have a data path. Data path is a lot of the wires. Uh, basically, it's a matter inside the IC design. So a lot of wires, connection, interconnect, all those names. So it's connected from one uh, place to another. So these are called the data path. After that, we discuss about the memory. We have the memory, we have a cache. Uh, sometimes we have L1 and L2, and we do have L3 cache. Then we also talk about the mean memory of RAM. After that, we talk about the virtual memory. After that, we talk about some uh, input output devices like hard disk, hard disk, and also CD-ROM uh, and other devices. So these are the input output devices. So today we are mainly uh, focusing on a very specific part, which is the input and output system. I stand for input and O stand for output. So this input output system are very special components because without this input and output, we won't be able to uh, tell the computer what to do. And computer also cannot communicate with us. So that's why these are, a very, these are the very important and major components of a computer. Some of you might use a touchscreen handphone uh, then uh, you can actually touch a certain position on your handphone, and this is also called an input system. So what is the important matrix for an input-output system? What is the matrix? Matrix is a form of measurement. Measurement means uh, how to see whether this input-output system is good or not. How good is it? Uh, how bad is it? So these is, are the input uh, important matrix for an I.O. system. So the first thing we want to see is the performance. What is the performance? How fast is it? Performance, for example, uh, let's say we have a USB 1.0 and then we have the USB 2.0. Which one is actually better? The performance of USB 2 is actually higher than the performance of USB 1. Why? Because the speed are many times higher, right? Many times higher. So also we want to know the expandability. Uh, if you have a uh, one hard disk, let's say you buy a hard disk uh, for a computer, can you extend it with the SSD storage? Another type of hard disk, uh, SSD, okay, static storage device, and then dependability. Whether your I/O system depend on any of the driver, whether your uh, I/O system can plug into any any of the computer, yeah, that's very important. For example, let's say if you buy a USB hard disk, you have no worry. Yeah? USB uh, device, uh, all these devices can be easily plugged into plug and play. Yeah? we call it plug and play plug into any of the computer, then it doesn't depend on the type of computer you can use. All the computer can, can, can use these USB devices, basically. And then what are the costs? Of course, for the costs, uh, SSD is, be, uh, is actually has a higher price than the hard disk, and then the size, uh, and then also the width. You want to know how heavy is your hard disk? If your hard disk is very, very heavy, like uh, 10 kg, uh, maybe 20, 30 years ago, many people will want to buy, but today, nobody will want to buy your 10 kg hard disk. Yeah. So these are the important metrics for to measure an input and output system. 
So these are the input and output devices that are available in the market and also in front of us. In front of you, uh, if you are using a laptop, you will see a keyboard. A keyboard is a very important input device. And the partner that we have is a human. So the human is you, uh, uh, is you, uh, okay, is you. So you actually use the keyboard as an input. Then we have a data rate. The data rate is very, very small. For example, uh, one kilobit per second. So the highest you can type is maybe one kilobit per second. This is also depends on whether you can type fast or slow. Okay. And then we also have a mouse. A mouse is a very important device, also input device uh, used by you, the human. It's uh, slightly having a higher data rate. Why? I say that it's a higher data rate because let's say if you, uh, some of you actually, you like to play some games, right? Uh, many of the games, you can use a mouse to control the character in your games. Like uh, let's say if you play that, uh, for example, one of the very famous game, uh, uh, maybe in the uh, past few years is PUBG. Uh. Uh, PUBG, uh, some people might use a mouse if you buy the licensed one, you can use a mouse and then you, you play, right? It's better than using a keyboard uh, because sometimes keyboard is not so fast, right? So it's a lot faster. So you can directly move from one place and then go to another place or directly uh, and then move to another place again. Uh, yeah, very fast, right? And then uh, shoot, shoot the person, right? Uh, like that, uh. So the mouse is a very fast uh, device. And then we also have a laser printer. A laser printer is a output system and also handled by the human. Of course, the computer have to uh, be programmed to print out to the laser printer. The speed is higher. Then we have graphic displays. Uh, this one, everyone know, uh, it's output and human. So I believe uh, many of you like to play games, computer games. So graphic displays actually can play very, very high data per second. You can play up to eight, Thousand, uh, eight thousand megabytes, uh, megabit. Uh, this is a bit. Uh, sorry, uh, bit. Big B is a byte. So small B is a bit. Eight thousand bit means a uh, one gigabyte per second. So one gigabyte graphical space per second. Wow, very very huge. Uh, yeah, yeah. And then we have a network and also local area network. This is local area network. And local network network is actually an uh, input and output system. You can get the data and also you can send the data, but this one also only handled by machines. You don't uh, purposely go and uh, hand, do, go and read this data, right? You don't purposely. And then you also don't purposely send the data. And the speed can go to one gigabit per second. Uh, one giga is uh, slightly less than one giga, but around one gigabit. Eh? So magnetic disk uh, can go up to 2.56 gigabit. So they can send a few hundred mega uh, bytes per second. Uh. So uh, magnetic disk is a storage system. So it is not an input, uh, but uh, it has been put here, input output system, but it can be put here. This is part of the storage system. So it's a uh, deal with a uh, machine. So this is all the behavior, partner, and data rates for all those devices. So there are eight orders of magnitude range from a keyboard, which is the slowest, and go to the magnetic disk, and also network, and also graphic card, which is the highest. Uh, for example, when you buy a handphone, uh, if you want to play game, right, of course, you will buy a better handphone. Yeah, then you can play a very, very good game. Uh. Uh, if you just buy a normal uh, handphone, you still can play a game, but the resolution will be lower. Uh, then maybe you feel not so happy, right? To play such a low resolution uh, graphic display. Uh. So the IO uh, performance measurement, basically based on the IO bandwidth. What is the bandwidth? We already learned about the bandwidth here. Uh, all the data rate, why is the data rate over here? The bandwidth. 
Mr. Throughput, amount of information that can be input or output and communicated uh, across and wire interconnect. Uh. When we talk about this interconnect, uh, this is a special term for a wire for the IC design. In IC design, we call it, and in computer, we call it interconnect. We don't call it a wire. Why don't we call it a wire? Because if we tell people I connect using a wire from this transistor to another, uh, people will say you are not uh, in this field, uh, you are other field one. Uh, uh, you are out of the field. Uh. So that's why they have to say uh, this is interconnect, method one, method two, method three, all are interconnect. Uh, but actually it's a wire. Uh, uh, it's the same thing. Uh. To the processor and memory, I owe device per unit time. So how much data can we move through a system in a certain time? So for a keyboard, it's very slow. But for a uh, graphic display, it's very, very high resolution. And how many I.O. operations can we do per unit time? Uh, what, how many I.O. operations? This one we will discuss later in a few slides later. And also the I.O. response time means the latency. When I click a button, how fast you give me the results. So this is the latency. So this is how many bit, let's say 200 byte per second. But this one is how many, how much time you need? 20 nanosecond. Uh -huh. So this one is called the latency. How late is it? The root word is actually late. So the latency is a noun. So latency means how late is it? The total elapsed time uh, to accomplish an input or output operations. So it's an especially important performance metric in real-time system. For example, if I drive an aeroplane, a pilot is driving an aeroplane. When he or she see a bird or eagle flying in front of the plane, then he tries to push a button telling the plane to move to left or uh, using uh, his device, uh, the, the uh, steering, uh, whatever. So the pilot, you need to have very fast response. Uh, let's say if the response time is five seconds, uh, then already uh, turn on the uh, eager, uh, the hawk, uh, okay? So already hit the hawk. That's why the response time is very important for a real-time uh, system. Uh, and now we talk about game. If let's say you only you push the gun uh, button, then inside the game, uh, uh, you wait until two seconds only, you fire, then uh, you will lose the game, right? So that's why in the real-time application, the latency is very, very important. So we have the bandwidth and latency. And many applications require both high throughput and short response times. Uh, also, this comes to the uh, all the game, uh, okay? Uh, there are some, uh, actually, also got uh, some programmers actually focus on creating some games uh, yeah, for, uh, for entertainment purpose. So this is a typical input and output system. We have talked about a uh, computer actually has a processor and is connected using uh, connected to a cache. Inside here we have the L1 cache and then here L2, L3. Yeah. Then it is uh, the L2, L3 cache actually connect to the memory using something called the IO bus, memory bus and uh, IO bus, memory IO bus. So it's actually a memory bus, and it's also used for I/O bus. So that's why uh, the computer designer say it's a memory dash I/O bus. So it's used for both of them because they want don't want to uh, they don't want it to be too many buses there, so they just put one bus. Uh, one another reason is mean memory also sometimes have to uh, connect to the I/O directly. Uh, this is a technology called the DMA. Uh, we call it direct memory access. So uh, direct memory access is very important, meaning that any data can go, uh, the processor can tell me memory, I want uh, certain data, one gig data from here, uh, one gigabyte data from me memory, you directly transfer to uh, my disk. Uh, so processor just go to give an instruction, uh, instruction, uh, then me memory and all the uh, and all the parts uh, will, will perform uh, directly uh, through a uh, method called direct memory access. Uh, this one also same. Uh, for example, let's say you watch some movie, the memory, uh, they will also go from uh, 
direct from the memory to somewhere else. Okay, so uh, direct memory access to the disk and graphic disk space, wherever. So this is a very important uh, architecture of a computer. So anything happen. So all these devices will give an uh, interrupts to a pro processor. So the processor will be able to stop it. If let's say interrupt, that processor will stop the things. Yeah. So besides the main memory, we also have some I.O. controller. These I.O. controllers are very important. Yeah, later we will talk about what are those uh, I.O. controller. Yeah. We have the uh, we have we have a lot uh, later we will talk about it. So the I.O. controller can actually con uh, connect to the disk. And this here, there are many uh, hard disks can be connected to the I.O. controller, and also the graphics card, and also the network. All those has to be con uh, connected to the I.O. controller. Why? Yeah, uh, let's see why. Uh. So uh, let us see the system performance. The system performance uh, is about designing an I.O. system to meet a set of bandwidth. Uh, let's say 100, I want something that 100 giga bit per second. So I put it down, the bandwidth is 100 giga bit per second. And the latency, I say the latency must be 10 uh, nanosecond response time. So this is my spec. Yeah. So now, if you want to design an IO system, you need to find. What, what do you need to do? You need to find uh, the weakest, weakest part, according to M-Star law, the weakest part is the one that you need to improve. For example, uh, let's say if you find uh, that uh, the weakest part is at a certain component that you must improve it. So you're finding the weakest link of uh, I.O. system, weakest link, and the components that constrains the design. Last time, uh, the I.O is always the weakest link inside a computer because processor can be very fast. And also the graphic card can be very fast, but the I.O. because it's very long wire. Now I talk about wire, it's actually interconnect. Uh. It's very long interconnect. That's why. Because you need to transmit data from very long distance. That's why your I.O. system must be the slowest components. Yeah. So the processor and the memory system or the underlying hidden one, uh, hidden interconnections, like a bus. A bus is also an interconnect. Uh, so it's, this is another term for interconnect. But a bus is something more complex, uh, more complex interconnect. So also the I.O. controller. Uh, why, why do you have USB? Yeah, USB is uh, one type of the I.O. controller. Yeah. Do you ever know that uh, USB is an I.O. controller? Okay, now we are learning about this. Also, I.O. devices themselves. Uh, when you have a USB, you also have some pen drive, right? So a pen drive is also one type of I.O. devices. I.O. devices connect to the USB. Your USB is an I.O. controller. Then your I.O. controller, you go to the I.O. memory bus, which is your motherboard, okay? Your motherboard is a part of the motherboard is actually a memory I.O. Uh, I.O. bus, okay? So the, third, uh, the second uh, step is to reconfigure the weakest link uh, to meet the bandwidth and the latency requirement. What happens in today's computer? Let's say if uh, in uh, 10 years ago, the problem exists. The computer cannot run very fast is because of uh, the hard disk. The hard disk is actually the bottleneck for a computer. That's why. Now today, most computer wants to use SSD because this is a 60 uh, static uh, storage device. So this one is a lot faster, but this one is actually a mechanical uh, device, mostly mechanical, uh, electromechanical, uh, because the head is actually mechanical. They need to uh, turn the motor and the head to read some data. So this one will be less, uh, will be uh, slower and then we go to the SSD which is faster we go to use the electric so SSD is a lot faster now that's why most of the computer now today if possible please buy a SSD yeah for your new computer next computer 
uh, because it's a lot faster. How fast is it? Uh, if you have an SSD computer, you just turn the power button in a, a few seconds, you can start to work already. Yeah. So that's how fast is it? Uh? Really, it's like a RAM. Uh, it's a RAM that is far away from your uh, processor, but it's a RAM. Uh. Yeah. But uh, the difference between it as a RAM is uh, because it's non volatile, the data will not disappear. So it's very, very good. Uh? Okay. Determine the requirement for the use for the rest of the components and reconfiguring them to support the latency and or bandwidth. So you have to see uh, how you connect the new components, either through a USB or other types of device, uh, like HDMI, uh, what, what, uh, what, what connection you want to make. Eh? Uh, now we are talking about uh, IO system performance example. Uh, this workload, consists of 64 kilobyte rigs and writes where the user uh, programs executes 200,000 instructions per disk IO operations. So the user program executes 200,000 instructions per disk IO operation. So one disk IO operation, let's say I say I want to read certain data, the user program need to execute 200 instructions they move AH2 and then move BH3, interrupt 21, uh, and then they need to do 200,000 times. Uh, you see, uh, it's not easy. Uh. Of course, look and look, uh, look again. Uh. Yeah, they have to keep on looping and then sometimes wait for some time. So you need 200,000 instruction times. So a processor that sustains 3 billion instructions per second, uh, mostly 3 gigabyte clock rate, uh, 3 gigabyte uh, clock rate. Uh. So an average, 100,000 OS uh, instruction yeah, uh, to handle uh, this I.O. operations. So the maximum this I.O. rate or I.O.'s uh, operations per second of the processor is, uh, let's uh, use uh, one minute to think about the answer. What is the Uh, maximum this I.O. rate or I.O. operation per second. How many? Okay, let me give you the answer, yeah? First, this one quite difficult, yeah? So, this is uh, what is mean by this. Uh. So, instruction execution rate. It's actually three. 3 billion instruction per second. So we have 3 billion. Uh. 3 billion instruction per one second. And then this one, instruction per I.O. is 200 plus 200 uh, plus 100. 200,000 is here. Because the program you use 200,000 uh, instruction. And then uh, the processor, you use 100,000. Uh, Yeah, OS instructions to handle uh, this I.O. operation. So your program use 200,000 and your operating system and your processor need 100,000. So total, you yeah, have 300,000. So have total 300,000. So your instruction execution rate is 3 billion instruction per second. That's why you have a 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 10,000 I.O. instruction per second. Because one uh, I.O., one I.O., one I.O. operation, you need 300,000 uh, instructions. And your computer can execute 3 billion instructions per second. So for one second, your computer can execute 10,000 I.O. operations. This is the meaning of this question. So, and then we continue to see, yeah? So, uh, memory I.O. bus. Uh, this is the bus that we are talking about uh, just now. Uh, that sustain a transfer rate of 1,000 megabyte per second. Yeah. And then you have this uh, memory I.O. bus that sustain a transfer rate of 1,000 mega 
byte per second. Then each disk, I already write 64 kilobyte. So that the maximum I O rate of the bus is so one I O operations can do 64 kilobyte. This is for one I O operation. Okay, one I O operation do 64 kilobyte. So what is the maximum I O rate? So we have can have 10,000 I O operation. So each I O operation do 64 kilobyte. So multiply lah, huh? so you get yeah, something like this. Huh? And then, or you can use other, yeah. So here, uh, here is the different thing. Uh. So let's say that the bus bandwidth is, yeah. The bus bandwidth is actually uh, 1,000 megabyte per second. So you have 64 kilobyte, 64 kilobyte. So you can do how many I/O operation? Uh, that is uh, the other round, uh, the, uh, the other way, yeah. Uh. So the other way around, so we have a thousand, uh, thousand megabyte, yeah, mega, thousand megabyte per second. So we have the byte per IO is 64K. So that's why for every second, you can do 15,625 IO operations, but your comp processor can do 10,000 IO operations per second. Your I.O. memory I.O. bus can do 15,625 I.O. operation. So which one is faster? For processor or uh, memory I.O. bus? Of course, this one, right? This one higher. So the weakest part is processor. Yeah. Now we continue. Huh? So the weakest part is actually a processor. And then the stronger part is a memory I.O. bus. So if you are a computer designer or architect, you will not want to improve the processor uh, anymore, right? You, uh, sorry, you, you want to improve the processor more, right? So you don't want to improve the memory IO bus at this time because your processor actually is uh, less, right? So if you improve this, no use. Why? Because uh, 15,000 is already higher than the processor. No matter how fast you can make your uh, memory IO bus run. You will not improve the computer because the processor, the limit is at the processor. It's, this is according to the M star law as well. Uh, now we are going to the other part of the of a computer. We are going to the disk IO controller. This is called the SCSI disk. SCSI is a very important system now. SCSI. Uh, what how to name this SCSI uh, in the long Small computer system interface. Yeah, before uh, PCI Express, this uh, PCI, we have a technology. SCSI is uh, before the PCI, they mainly before PCI Express. So now our computers are all using a PCI Express. Okay, PCI Express, current, uh, what, what we do, uh, our, uh, all the, we are using the PCI Express, plug in the SSD. Yeah. Uh, uh, before the, this uh, PCI Express is made very, very famous. Uh, so people use the small computer system interface, SCSI, this IO controller with a direct memory access. So this is a direct memory access. Uh, I want to tell a little bit story about this direct memory access because last time, uh, maybe 20 years ago, when a computer is not good, it's not, not good uh, in playing videos. Uh, let's say you will bring some CD, VCD from outside, video CD ROM from outside, and then you want to play using your computer can. But sometimes it's very slow because the data have to be transferred from CD ROM, go to the bus, go to the memory, and then it has to go to the bus again and then go to the video card. It's very, very slow. That's why after that, uh, they already use this technology called direct memory access. They directly have a direct line connect your CD-ROM directly to uh, the motherboard or your graphic card directly. That's why you have a direct memory access. Then you can play your video nicely. 
Yeah. Processor also do not want to know anything about uh, what you play, uh, whatever, right? You just send your data to the video card, that's it. Yeah, that's how it works. Uh. So we have a DMI transfer rate of 320 megabyte per second. So it's uh, slightly slower than the uh, min bus memory IO bus. So you can accommodate up to seven disks per controller. So you can uh, put seven hard disks there. And then this drive with a rate write bandwidth of 75 megabit, megabyte per second and an average six plus rotational latency of six milliseconds. Okay, so what is the maximum sustainable IO rate and what is the number of this and SCSI controller required to achieve that rate? Let us uh, see the uh, diagram for this, uh, this IO system example. We have a processor which can run 10,000 IO operations per second. And then we have a cache. And then we have the memory IO bus. We have already calculated it can run 15,000, slightly more than 15,000 IO operations per second. Now, we have this 320 megabyte per second and 75 megabyte per second. There are seven of them. If you want to install, you can install uh, seven. So now, so the processor is a bottleneck not the memory I.O. bus because processor uh, runs less I.O. Uh, operations. So the disk drive with the read write bandwidth of 75 megabyte uh, per second and an average seek time plus rotational latency of 6 milliseconds. So you have the total read time for one I.O. is 6 milliseconds one time for an S64 kilobyte per 75 uh, megabyte per second. So total, if you add up, it will be 6.5, uh, 6.9 millisecond per one IO operation. This is for your disk drive. So you have a 10,000 IO operation per second. The processor can do this. So basically, the disk can complete 10,000, uh, sorry, 1,000 uh, millisecond per 6.9 millisecond. So you will be able to run one, four, six IO operation per second. Yeah. When you processor can do 10,000 over one, four, six, the processor can do for 69 disks together. This is the maximum that the computer can operate. Yeah. Of course, uh, this computer is for, not for our home. Huh? We don't, we are not so uh, demand. Uh, we, we are not so demanding on, of this uh, very large hard disk. Uh, but the company like Facebook and also uh, WhatsApp, all those companies, uh, they need a lot of hard disk. So this is their problem. Who knows one day you will work with them in Google, like in Facebook, uh, then you will have to handle all this problem. So now we calculate the number of SCSI disk controller. We need to know the average transfer rate per disk to ensure that we have uh, we put the maximum of seven disks per SCSI controller. And then this controller won't saturate the memory IO bus during a DMA transfer. So this is the transfer rate, uh, 64 kilobyte per IO operation, and then over the 6.9 milliseconds, so we have 9.56 megabyte per second. So one second you can transfer, uh, one second you can transfer 9.56 megabyte. So seven this won't saturate either the SCSI controller, SCSI controller very fast, 320 megabyte per second, and also memory IO bus also can sustain. That means that uh, we will need a 69 per seven or 10 SCSI controller to maximize the usage uh, and saturate your processor. Yeah. So a processor will, will face problem if let's say you have more than 10, uh, 10 SCSI controller. Yeah, this is your IO controller. Of course, uh, all of us won't use all so many hard disks. Uh. Yeah, we don't want so many hard disks, but who knows one day you work with Google, you work with uh, Facebook, uh, you work with those uh, computer companies, they will need a lot of electrical engineers. Of course, because uh, computer scientists do not know a lot about the uh, devices, so you have to, they have to have an E&E &E engineers there. Yeah. So uh, we... Furthermore, we will talk about the I.O. system interconnect issues. Uh, we will talk about a bus. Now, what is a bus? A bus is not a... Uh, what's the call? Uh, it's not that one. Uh. 
It's a bus in the computer is a wire. A wire that can be controlled. Uh, bus is a shared communication link uh, that needs to support a range of devices with widely varying latencies and data transfer rate. So the advantage is for the bus is actually very versatile and very low cost. Uh, what is this bus? Okay, let's go back and see the bus. Okay, so this is the bus. So here we have one bus, which is a memory I.O. bus. So this bus actually is shared between all these components and also processors. So what is the disadvantage of the bus? It will create some communication bottleneck. So it limit the uh, maximum throughput and also the bandwidth. So maximum bus speed is largely limited by the length of the bus and number of devices. So the higher, uh, the, the longer your wire inside a computer, the slower the transmission rate will be because the speed of the electricity is as fast as light speed, right? It cannot be uh, faster than that. That's why uh, the speed will be limited by a length of your wire. Also the number of devices of your bus because of course you need to share the data. So this is the bus characteristic. In the bus, we have a control line, your data line. Control line means the bus master will tell the bus slave, I want to transfer data. I want transfer data, okay? Then what we do? So the bus will transfer the data. So there will be a control line to signal request and acknowledgement and also indicate which type of information is on the data line. Then you also have the data line. It's about the data address, complex commands, anything, any data you want to send over. So bus transaction consists of a master, slave, uh, master means uh, the one that requests, action means the slave. The master say, always uh, because, uh, because now, now today we don't have the slavery system. Uh, uh, very long time ago, uh, maybe in Egypt, uh, very long time ago, very, very long time ago, a uh, few hundred uh, thousand years ago, uh, they have the master state, uh, that's why they use this term. Uh, okay, so uh, defined by what transaction does to memory, we have the input and output. So this is uh, the, what, what type of transaction does to the memory. So these are the type of bus. We have a processor memory bus. Uh, this is a proprietary. This, uh, this one is inside an IC. The bus is inside, uh, let's say, uh, inside the, the computer. Uh, processor and memory bus. It's short and high speed and match the memory system to maximize the memory processor bandwidth and optimize for cache block transfer. So let's say a cache is inside L1. Uh, so there will be a bus there uh, to trans uh, transfer data within the processor. So we also have the I.O. bus. I.O. bus is related to the memory I.O. bus. Yeah. So this memory I.O. bus, uh, basically we have SCSI. We have a small computer system interface. And we also have the USB. USB. And then we also have the FireWire. Uh, for those people who have bought uh, Apple, maybe you have heard about this term. Uh. For me, I never used Apple before. So that's why I, uh, for me, it's a very foreign. Uh, it's a very... Uh, it's not very used to me, uh, okay? Uh, I'm not very used to this term. So usually it's lengthy and slower and need to accommodate a wide range of I.O. devices and connect to the processor memory bus or backplane bus. Yeah. The third bus is actually a backplane bus. So this is the PCI Express. Yeah, PCI Express uh, and ATA. What's this ATA? Uh, I also haven't heard about this. ATA basically is a SATA. SATA is an old type of the hard disk controller. We have a SATA, serial ATA. Yeah, serial ATA, eh? ATA. So we also have the PCI Express. PCI Express is currently used uh, in all our computers, especially for Intel uh, computer. Yeah, uh, using Intel uh, processor and also chipset, motherboard. Uh, so we are currently using the PCI Express for the motherboard. The backplane is actually uh, interconnection structure within the chassis. It's a uh, very mean, the big one, the biggest one. Yeah, on the motherboard. Yeah, used as an intermediate bus. 
intermediary bus connecting IO bus to the processor memory uh, bus. So between the IO bus and also there is a back end bus uh, for a layman, we call it motherboard, okay? Uh, motherboard or chipset. Uh. So a more, more professional term, we call it chipset. But for a layman, we call it motherboard. Yeah. And then uh, if uh, you don't know about computer, it's just a computer board. Uh. Yeah. So if you know a little bit more, you will see it's a PCI Express, whatever. So we have the two, two types of the bus. One type we call it synchronous bus. Synchronous bus is like the DMA. DMA. Uh, synchronous bus uh, can also uh, mostly a DMA, mostly a synchronous. Okay, so synchronous bus is like the processor memory bus. So it includes a clock in the control line as a fixed protocol and uh, communication that is relative to the clock. So they just use some signals. Synchronous means that we use a clock. Yeah, the instruction will, uh, will the data will be sent for every clock. Yeah, they will wait for the clock and then they will do. They don't care anything. There's no acknowledgement. Yeah, so it involves very little logic and can run very fast. But the disadvantage is uh, every device communicating or the bus must use the same clock rate. Uh, and then to avoid the clock skew, uh, they cannot be very long if they are fast. So for the asynchronous bus, it's a very safe one. For example, it's the IO bus. They have the rate request acknowledge and data ready. So the advantage of acknowledge bus is it can accommodate wide range of device. Any device also can use it. It can be lengthened without worrying about the clock skew because any data you transfer, you have to get some acknowledgement. This advantage is slow. Yeah, we are almost going to the last one. Huh? So this is how a synchronous bus handshaking protocol. So if you want to work with other people, you usually handshake. Huh? Uh, when you do WhatsApp communication with your friend, you also, sometimes you have a symbol like this, right? Handshake, huh? yeah, shake hand. Huh? Yeah, so yeah, it's uh, very important because uh, this is how the Synchronous bus work. Uh. So what they do is first, I all device signal a request to raising the rig request, and then putting the address on the data line. So if you want to transfer some data from the IO uh, device, what you do first, you do this. Uh, first step, you need to send the rig request to a, uh, for example, uh, to a uh, hard disk. Uh, so now. You send the address. I want this address and send a re request. Okay, the memory will see this. Memory, oh, sorry, uh, this one we use a memory. Uh. We send to the memory. We see the re request. Then we read the address and then raise the knowledge here. So the memory already see the request. So it has to acknowledge. After it acknowledge, then the processor, or I, uh, sorry, the IO device, you need to. Uh, put down this rig uh, request. Uh, already acknowledge uh, so okay la, I don't request anymore. La. You already received, right? So I, I turn down become zero. Yeah. Then you will release the the and release the rig request and data line. So data will be put here according to this address. Next. So the memory see the rig request go down and then it will drop the acknowledge uh, handshake, right? So you already done the acknowledge, but you see already go low already. Uh. You read, then you go low some more. Uh. Okay. So when the memory has the data ready, uh -huh, then memory has the data ready, it pays on data line and raise the data ready. So you put data ready over here. So the IO device will see the data ready. Uh -huh. So what it does, it will raise the data to the data line and then only it will raise the acknowledge, acknowledge again. So when it's, uh, the IO device see the acknowledge, so it release the data line. Yeah, so nothing will be on the data line and drop the data ready. So the data line is now ready for other device to be used. So that's why it's always have to have the handshake, handshaking protocol. Some protocol, protocol means some way to communicate with uh, each other. Let's say if you go to some place also got some protocol, right? You go to a government SNC, you have to have some protocol, right? You have to make appointment, you have to uh, dress properly, you have to, uh, sometimes you have to send a letter first, uh, get approval first, like that. Uh. So this is a protocol, it's a handshaking, uh. yeah, handshaking protocol. 
So IO device see the data uh, ready, go low and drop the knowledge and everything done. And then IO memory bus is empty again. So that wire all empty. Yeah? So what happened if empty the other might raise the request uh, like that. Uh? So this is how the bus work. Uh. So this is called a handshaking. It's handshake. Uh, I acknowledge and then I make a request and acknowledge already Then I have to put my request down, right? I have to uh, get back my request, right? Put it zero again. So it's handshaking, you can see. So this is all for the IO device. So if you have any question, you can let me know. Yeah, I'll give you like a few minutes to ask me any question before we take a rest. After that, we will start our presentation. Uh, then please turn on your camera, and then dress properly. And then uh, we will listen to your presentation in 10 minutes. Uh. Don't be too long, uh, because if too long, we be very boring. Uh. So 10 minutes only, uh, we limit to 10 minutes for each processor. So thank you. Any problem that you want to ask? Any problem you want to ask me about I.O.? OK, if no question, then very good. Uh, we will rest for 15 minutes as usual. We'll come back three. Zero one, nah. Two zero one. Okay, see you in fifteen minutes. Three one one, nah. Three one, sorry. Three one. Three one one, nah. Yeah, around there, lah. Okay, see you later. Thank you.
Hi, very good afternoon. Uh, 15 minutes has passed so fast, right? Yeah. Uh, actually, we have already finished our lectures. Uh, so I'm thinking whether uh, we can speed up like on Friday, we can also present a few. After that, next week also present. Then the earlier we present, finish presenting, uh, maybe we can start our revision earlier. Lah. So it will be okay for you. Uh. Anyone also can start because I see the schedule here. Uh, most of you choose to be 13 or <laughs> it's quite, quite, yeah, quite late. Uh. So maybe for 13 uh, or please uh, present earlier. Uh, also as early as possible. Yeah. Yeah. So please prepare your presentation as soon as possible. So today who is ready for presentation? May I know? Yeah, who, who is ready for presentation for today? Uh, like, uh, yeah. Uh, we we present first. Yes. We present first. Uh, you want to present first, uh, we hong, uh? Uh, Yes, yes. Okay. okay, sure. 30, yeah, it's today, yeah? Yeah, correct. Okay, uh, if other groups you want to present, also can. Uh, anytime you can fit in, but I give priority to Wei Hong and Brenda. Chai Siu, Wei Hong, Brenda. Yeah, so let's present. After that, anyone can ask any, ask any question, yeah? So let me jot down the name. Uh. The first group who present is Chai Siu and Wei Hong. Uh. Cha, chai Siu and mm, Wei Hong. first group okay next group uh can be brenda if any other groups you want to present this uh do so yeah after brenda and also should we okay you may start now uh, i will uh and present myself yeah then you can turn on your camera and also your mic, uh, both of you, uh, uh, Chai Siu and also Wei Hong. Yeah, I leave the presentation to you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, a very good afternoon to Sir and my fellow classmates. So my name is Wei Hong and my teammate is Chai Siu. Uh, today we would like to discuss about the IBM processor. So IBM Corporation is one of the biggest technology companies in the world. Uh, this company has started one of the strongest brands in the computing technology industry. So in 1990, uh, IBM Corporation introduced a series of microprocessors named as Power. The Power uh, name Power stands for Performance Optimization with Enhanced RISC. Power 1 is the earliest generation and Power 9 is the latest generation for the power series. IBM Power Processor has been applied in IBM on servers and supercomputers such as uh, RS6000, 6, AS400, P series, I series, System P, System I, and Power System. They are also widely used in IBM data storage devices and other server ma manufacturers such as Boo and Hitachi. So as the launch latest generation of Power microprocessor family, Power9 is the only processor integrated with standard of the I.O. subsystem technology uh, consisting of NVIDIA NVLink 2.0, PCIe Generation 4, and IBM Open's CAPI interface. Uh, furthermore, from what IBM has said, a uh, power power nine microprocessor is specially made for enterprise AI. It is fully cloud ready. The main the main selling point of power nine would be its support for big data and AI, which both are the leading trend in current technology market. So next, uh, here is the comparison between power nine and Intel Core i seven. So as we can see from the table, the green color indicate the better spec. So overall, the IBM Power9 is but the the I, IBM Power9 processor has a better performance compared to the Intel Core i7. Power9 offers 24 core with a clock rate of 4 GHz, 
while Intel Core i7 uh, only offered a core with a core rate of 2.9 GHz. So although there is Intel Triple Boost integrated with it Core i7, which boosts the core rate up to 4.8 oh, GHz, yet it is still slower than Power 9. So uh, L2 and L3 cache of the Power 9 is 512 kilobyte per core and 120 megabyte per core, while L2 and L3 cache of Intel Core i7 is 256 kilobyte per core and 16 megabyte per core. The cache is always used to reduce time and energy for accessing data from the main memory. So the larger the L2 and L3 cache, the better the processor. Uh, there is a big difference in the number of transistors among these two processors. It's obvious that the transistor in Power9 are much more than the Intel Core i7. The increasing number of transistors make transistors smaller. The smaller the transistor causes the transistor to be closer together and take less energy to turn on or off. Since the transistor takes time to charge or discharge, the less the charge needed, the faster the transistor goes. So in short, the more the transistor, the better the processor. Next, I would like to pass the presentation to my teammate, Chai Xiu. All right, so from what Wei Hong has presented, it seems that IBM Power 9 is superior than Intel Core i7 in weather processing performance or memory. However, in personal computer, PC, and desktop market, it seems that IBM loses to Intel, and Intel dominates almost the whole market. But we thinking from the logical way, it is impossible to apply IBM power processor series with high-end uh, high design in a PC or laptop. We, we don't need such a high performance processor in the ordinary desktop or PC. It's like a large material for paper use, which is a waste on the processor's use, not to mention the higher cost to the PC and the laptop we buy. So in short, we, both the Power9 and Core i7 has great difference on their processor performance, but it cannot be said that Core i7 is worse than Power9 or Power9 is used to uh, Core i7, as both companies are focusing on different markets. But in recent years, IBM Max is more on the desktop market again with, uh, with the Open Power Foundation. So the biggest strategy is to offer open sourcing of power processor. Uh, the open sourcing of power processors, architectures, and blueprint. And the design of power processors would be further modified by its alliance member to introduce more powerful processors to adopt to adopt in different applications. Well, the open power founders are IBM itself, NVIDIA, Google, Millennials, and Tyant. So for the significant examples, Power9 and Power8 processors have, have included uh, NVIDIA's latest bus technology and Vlink 2.0 in the processor architecture. Well, is this open power a bad news to Intel? I think the answer is yes, because for the companies who wish to move their dependence away from the proprietary technology by other com uh, companies, they now can manufacture their own CPU chips with uh, adding desired specification on the blueprint offered by IBM. But for Intel, it would be a great suffer to it as no more revenue can be generated from those companies due to the loss of the dependence from them. But for IBM, IBM has no loss with the open sourcing of its processor design. Instead, it cracked down the market for Intel, who has monopolized the desktop market for the cat. And it used this open power strategy to fold up Intel's dominance of CPU market, rather than using its, micro, uh, its power processor a dead web when comparing to Intel iCore in this desktop market. So, in a nutshell, both Intel and IBM has continu 
continuously done great improvement and revolutions on their processor series in all aspects. However, it cannot be denied that in current desktop and mobile market, more and more companies increasingly introduce their powerful processors trying to stabilize their positions and values in CPU markets. For example, of the companies, AMD, ARM, Qualcomm, and even Apple have started to develop its first CPU chip M1 for the MacBook. So it can be seen that Intel's top positions in uh, desktop CPU market would be at risk in the future, even though IBM processors are not for desktop market, but it tries to crack down Intel's top positions in this market by the open power strategy. All right, that's all for our presentation today. Thank you. So thank you, uh, Wei Hong and also Chai Siu for presenting this. Uh, may I ask a question? Uh? Uh, for this Power9 processor, how many registers? Can you, can you explain a little bit how many registers are there in a uh, uh, in the processor, in the Power9 processors, yeah. Uh, anyone would like to answer uh, this one? Uh, what are those uh, registers inside the the Power Nine processor? Uh, Wei Hong or Chai Xiu? Um, I think we didn't uh, search the info about the register. We more on the architectures, uh, memories, and uh, other execution unit. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's fine. Uh, how how? Actually, uh, what market segment uh, is this uh, new processor Power9 actually uh, targeting? Uh? Which market segment? Uh? Is it, it's not uh, personal computer, right? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Of course, not personal computer. It is more on the uh, server and the supercomputer for this Power9 processor. So how, how, uh, if you any uh any uh application that you can foresee that this power nine processor uh can can be used in uh, which which kind of uh applications can be used for this power nine processor since you already promote it and then you found that it's very interesting and it can be a good challenge to intel processor yeah uh, actually, IBM didn't use the Power9 processor itself to compete with Intel. But uh, once it open source the architecture of Power9, then the other companies of these uh, open power members, they can get the, uh, the blueprint. Then like uh, one of the member is MSI. So, MSI, once they get this blueprint of Power9, then it can modify the architecture and make sure it, it is 
uh, able to adopt in the desktop, like maybe gaming desktop or other laptop. So IBM didn't use the Power9 processor itself. Instead, it used the open sourcing of the uh, power processors architecture and blueprint. Okay, thank you, uh, Chai Siu and Lee Hong for the wonderful presentation. Uh, any other members, uh, any other classmates who would like to ask any question uh, to Wei Hong and Chai Siu about this Power Y Power Nine processor? If you are interesting and you need to know anything, uh, please do ask him or her. Okay. Uh, Thank you for the wonderful presentation. If no questions, then thank you very much uh, to Chai Siu and also Wei Hong. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so thank you. So uh, can, can we go to the next group? Yeah. Next group should be Brenda Kui and also Kui Chiawen and also Lim Chun Wei, right? Are, uh, are you ready to take over the screen? Thank you. Uh, so you can present. So group presentation, I think, yeah, the, for the first group. Uh, a very good afternoon to Dr. Hong and my fellow classmate. Today, Brenda and I will be presenting AMD processor to you all. Basically, our presentation flow will be like this. Starting from an introduction to AMD processor, then comparison between AMD, uh, AMD and AMD processor, following by comparison of Intel i7 versus AMD Ryzen 7, roughly ending with our conclusion. Without further ado, Let's begin our presentation with the introduction. Okay, first of all, AMD in full name is Advanced Micro Devices, and it is founded by Jerry Sanders and Edwin Turney in 1969. AMD started their processor journey with the first two non-licensed processors produced in 1975, which are AM2900 and AM9080. For information, AMD has an agreement with Intel, which was IBM agreement in which Intel agreed AMD to clone their processor, and the clone processor was AM2900. Okay, next, uh, let's move on to the comparison part. Now you can see the comparison table of AM486 versus AM5x86. For your information, AMD launched its very first own processor in 1993, which is AM486. After two years' time, it launched the second processor, which is AM5X86. From the comparison table, we can see that after two years' time, the significant changes are on the L1 catch. Clock speed, FSB, fabrication, transistor count, and voltage required only. There is no much difference on the other spec. With the increased volume of L1 catch, the processor will be able to access the files and both. Uh, and store the files faster than AM486 L1 catch, which is only 8 to 15 kilobyte. In terms of, uh, in terms of clock speed, AM5X86 is also faster than AM486 in interpreting data like 0 and 1. For AM5X86, the size of it has also come to 350 nanometer only. And for information, AM5X86 uh, has no transistor inside it. Okay, now we are in the comparison of K5 versus K6, which both were processors produced by AMD in 1996 and 1997 respectively. We can observe that there is no much difference between both of them, and if compared to previous processor, there is no much change too. The only difference is 
the volume of L1 cache has been increased to 32 kilobyte plus 32 kilobyte. Meanwhile, the cross speed has been greatly increased to 266 uh, until 350 megahertz. This means K6 has faster speed of interpreting data than K5. In K6, there is a MMX and instruction set proposed by Intel has been used for K6 SIMD, which is single instruction, multi, uh, single instruction, multi, uh, multiple data. The size of K6 has become smaller in size, which is from 350 to 250 nanometer only. With the increased transistor count, K6 consumes more power than K5. Then, now we are in another generation of AMD processor, which are Thoroughbred and Button, launched in April 2002 and February 2003. As you can see from the table, the significant change is that both L1 cache has been increased to 64 kilobyte plus 64 kilobyte. The interesting part here is there exists the L2 cache. The L2 cache has the volume up to 512 kilobyte at full speed. The frequency of clock speed also increased to gigahertz and not megahertz anymore. 3D now is a time 86 instruction set introduced by AMD itself to perform better processing and hence increasing the speed of operating instructions. Both the processor has been fabricated in a smaller size compared to the previous processor, which is only 130 nanometer only. Their power consumption has also gone higher. When it comes to year 2003 and 2004, the architecture data bus and address bus of the processor has been increased to 64 bit for all. This phenomenon shows that the era of 32 bit has come to an end. The maximum memory support has increased to one terabyte, which is considered a lot. L2 cache is also increased to one megabyte at max, which means that is a faster recovery of bounds. The clock speed also increased to 2.6 gigahertz. The memory controller is a digital circuit that manages the flow of data going to and from the computer main memory. Hyper transport is a high speed point-to-point 32-bit technology for data transfer within the integrated circuit in computer and other devices. For Agena and Tournament, launched in November 2007 and March 2008, both of their L2 cache has been adjusted to be having 512 kilobyte at full speed compared to previous processor. There is an existence of L3 cache of size 2 megabyte. L3 fits L2 and L3 is slower than L2 but faster than main memory. The memory controller used is now dual channel and not single channel anymore. The speed of hyper transfer has been greatly improved to 2000 megahertz. Now exists the multiple core processor which is 4 core and 3 core and both of them are smaller in size which is only 65 nanometer. The significant difference between Tournament and AMD Bulldozer is L2 catch has been increased to five, uh, 2 megabyte and L3 catch has been increased to 8 megabyte. Also in Bulldozer, there is an add-on of AVX core at one factor extension. This AVX provides new feature, new instruction, and a new coding scheme. Bulldozer have different variations of core count, which are 4, 6, and 8. The higher the number of the cores, the faster the, the operation of the processor. Lastly, here comes the Ryzen series processor. It is launched on 2016. Basically, all the aspects are same with the AMD Bulldozer. The main difference is its clock speed can be up to 3.6 gigahertz and it uses dual channel DDR4 memory. And they, uh, the Ryzen is smaller in size, which is only 14 nanometer. And it is also the smallest processor that AMD has ever made. Uh, that's all for me. Now I will pass the presentation to Brenda.
Next, we'll be talking about the comparison between Intel i7 and AMD Ryzen 7. From the tabular representation above, we can observe that in terms of frequency, AMD Ryzen 7 has done a great job compared to Intel i7. Higher CPU frequency means more instruction can be operated in a given, a given amount of time. On the other hand, Intel i7 can be boosted up to 5 GHz per core, which is much more powerful compared to Ryzen 7. However, Ryzen 7 has 8 cores for the CPU. Meanwhile, Intel i7 has only 6 cores for its CPU. Without any doubt, the boost up by all cores of the processor relies on the number of CPU cores. The more the number of cores, the better the CPU is. In short, Ryzen 7 5800X is slightly more powerful than Intel i7 8086K in terms of all the aspects for CPU. GPU is a specialized processor originally designed to accelerate graphics rendering. From the tabular representation above, we can conclude that in terms of GPU, Ryzen 7 is considered a total loss to Intel i7, as AMD is initially invented without having an onboard GPU since it only depends on the motherboard which has support for internal graphics, APU, and availability of some display ports. In brief, in order to consider Ryzen 7 5800X as a success processor, a matchable GPU is required to be inserted into this processor. From the table above, we can see that in terms of memory, Ryzen 7 5800X is having a DDR4 3200 MHz RAM speed, as it is essential to support a heavy processor like in gaming operation. Meanwhile, it is more than enough for Intel i7 8086K to have only 2666 MHz RAM speed, as its focus is not mainly on gaming, but more on normal operation only. Both processors are having two memory channels, but Ryzen 7 can be calibrated to use the maximum memory of 122 GB, which is comparatively better than Intel i7. Most importantly, Ryzen 7 has an ECC, error correction code memory, related and bit data corruption. Hence, Ryzen 7 is doing a better job than Intel. PCIe Peripheral Device Interconnect Express is an interface standard for connecting high-speed components. You can connect GPUs, RAID's card, Wi-Fi cards, or SSD add-on cards to any desktop PC motherboard with a number of PCIe slots available. In a relationship with that, Ryzen 7 is having a version of 4.0 and 20 lanes for PCIe's, which we can conclude that it is better than Intel i7 which only have PCIe version of 3.0 and 16 PCIe things. In terms of invention technology, Ryzen 7 is only 7 nanometer in size compared to Intel i7 of 14 nanometer, which is almost double the size of AMD processor. We can say that it is a huge leap invention for AMD company in processor invention. It is clearly better to have a smaller size of processor in order to save up the total space. In addition, the price for both processors is only slightly different. Thus, if we intend to choose a more powerful processor for both gaming and normal operation, Ryzen 7 5800X is the preferable choice. Meanwhile, if you are looking for a processor with only average performances for normal operations, Intel i7 8086K is more than enough. In a nutshell, after considerations on factors like processors' cost, performances in every aspect and application, AMD Ryzen 7 5800X is relatively more preferable compared to Intel i7 8086K. For recommendation to AMD, it is more pleased if they, if they can achieve higher performances, lower power consumption features in their future invention of processors compared to the current Ryzen 7 series. That's all from us and thank you. So thank you very much for very informative uh, presentation from Chun Wei and also Brenda Kui Chawen. So thank you very much. And uh, may I ask a question? Yeah. So uh, just now you mentioned that uh, MD processor has no graphic cards. Uh. So uh, what is your 
Um, what is your recommendation for those who need to use uh, graphic, uh, graphic cards? Do they need to choose Intel or do they want to choose AMD or can they plug in a new graphic card? Uh, so uh, I will be answering your question. Uh, if we uh, want to add in the graphic cards, I recommend if they choose AMD uh, Ryzen 7 uh, 5800X as their processor, I recommend the user can additionally add in a graphic card. Uh, maybe the brand will be NVIDIA because I think NVIDIA has done a great job in the graphic area so so i think they can add in a better graphic card to have a better experience in gaming or other usage okay thank you very much uh, uh may i know uh, uh during your research uh about the power consumption uh, do you think uh, which, which processor is performing better in terms of power consumption? Uh, so do you mean the overall brand? Uh, overall, uh, maybe one processor to another processor. Which one you have a better power consumption? You mean within the AMD itself? Uh, it's, within, uh, it's between Intel and AMD. Between Intel and AMD. Uh, which one having a better power consumption, a lower power consumption? Any processor, I mean, uh, any processor, uh, maybe you show the slide presented by Brenda, then you can compare those two processors. Yeah, which one has a better, how much power is spent? Huh? Maybe another from, from the side you can see uh, AMD is cost uh, have to cost 105 watt for the usage. Meanwhile, the for Intel i7 8086K it is only 95 watt. So I think in terms of power consumption, Intel i7 has done a great job than AMD Ryzen 7 5800X. Yeah, okay, good. Very good. Uh yeah, so uh, because I think for Intel, basically, they focus on the uh, power consumption also. Uh. Yes. Very good. But, but uh, the technology that they use is actually 14 nanometer, right? Yeah. But AMD is using a uh, narrower, uh, narrower technology, right? 7 nanometer. Which yeah. is very narrow already. Yeah. Yeah. So AMD... Uh, why why uh, AMD can use seven nanometer? Have you done some study on this? Uh? Have you uh, anything about this? Uh, to be honest, uh, I haven't done any research. Why they have to use oh, this technology? Yeah, yeah. 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 Seven nanometer is indeed very very advanced already. Yeah, 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 yeah. very advanced already. Yeah, because right now, uh, there are. There are some companies actually that don't have their own pack. Uh. That means they don't have their own fabrication factories. Uh. So they use some fabrication factories from uh, countries like Taiwan. You know, uh, in Taiwan, there is a very famous fabrication uh, factory, uh, TSMC. Or oh, in Chinese called uh, Taijin, right? I'm not sure. TSMC Taiwan. Yeah, that one is. Correct. It's a very it's a, one of the biggest fabrication fact in the world. Uh, yeah, I'm sure Intel is also a fit of this TM, uh, TSMC, right? I saw the news on uh, Facebook. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. You you mean Intel? Oh, okay. So Intel actually has their own fabrication uh, factories, uh, but uh, some of the company actually they don't have. They will go to this TSMC uh, or other uh, factories to do it. Uh. Yeah. 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 Okay. Very uh, informative. 
uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, can I get some questions from other uh, students as well? If you have any questions, you can ask Shunwei and also Brenda. What Boon Kiong says is correct, uh, TSMC. TSMC is very famous. Uh. Yeah, it ha it's a very big uh, semiconductor company in Taiwan. It's already go to 7 nano and actually they want to go lower, lower than that. But there are some limitations uh, uh, due to some problems. Uh. Like, like what uh, I see and Wei Hong discussed just now, they're using FinTech uh, for the current technology. So it's also a very, very latest advanced technology. Uh, you can go and study the FinFET, then you will know what are the latest transistor that they use. Uh. So thank you very much, uh, Chunwei and Brenda. So uh, may I know uh, who else want to present today? Anyone ready already? You can make use of this time because eventually everyone need to present. Yeah, anyone is uh, ready? Yeah, thank you, uh, Brenda and Junwei. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Need, uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Who else want to present? Uh? I know. Can we move forward? Uh? Anyone already pre uh, prepared the presentation from here? This, uh, I, I think uh, for the April 13, we have a lot of, a lot already. Yeah. Uh? Yeah. Any volunteer <laughs> want to take up today's slot? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh Bun Kyung, you want to present today or not? Or oh, Ernest? Are you ready, Ernest? Or oh, Bun Kyung? Uh for this Friday, yeah, actually we have some time. Huh? Do you want to use it for presentation? Anyone? 13, 6, 6, we have 1, 2, 3, 5. Uh. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 13, we have too many. Uh. 13, we have too many. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Never mind, uh. we just follow a schedule here uh, since we already determined. Uh. But if you want to do it earlier, it's Okay, like it's fine. Eh? Yeah. yeah. Today we just have two groups to present. Eh? Actually, we want to hear more uh, from you eh? because the processor that you discuss about eh, is very interesting. Eh? Yeah. So, uh, if no problem, then, yeah, do you want to? Yeah. Okay. Thirty, thirty. you have to have some time to pre for preparation, right? Uh, let me ask. Uh, this, uh, 13 or April is too many people. Uh, do you want to move to Friday or not? This Friday. If you want, you can let me know. Uh, then we can have some uh, presentation. In my, uh, now we follow the schedule first. Okay, uh, for today, uh, I think we are already finished actually. Uh, any question you want to ask about uh, anything for this course? If no, then uh, let, let us do a little bit more, maybe. Let's see what I have. Uh. Yeah, we have some uh, past year papers. Maybe we can do a little bit past year. Uh, maybe just one question, then we can end. Uh, yeah. So, which year do you want? Uh? 2019 September. Uh, let's do a little bit question. For today, uh, already 
Tan a dito po. Uh, do you want to do one question on this? We'll do the question number two. Maybe describe the M star law. Uh, next, next I, I just make a gem, uh, gem board. Uh, for those who are not joining the tutorial class, uh, if you don't have a tutorial class, you if you want to leave, you can leave already. Yeah. yeah. That's, uh, for another session, actually, we have a tutorial class. Uh, if you want, you can uh, join together. Yeah. Let me share my screen. Yeah. Thank you for reminding me, Yao Ting. Yeah, we, we do this one. One question, then you can leave. Uh. Yes, I also don't want to drag you for so long. Uh, yeah. So you just do one uh, question. So if uh, on Friday you want to do presentation, you just let me know because we already finished our lecture. So if we don't do presentation, we just do some uh, revision only. And I will let you do your own exercise if you want. So this is the question for today. Describe the Amstar law. What is the Amstar law? Let me window shift S. Then we go to the gen file. Yeah, please uh, write your answer over here. What is the Amstar law, the first one? And then continue here. Uh, we continue to do this. Uh, yeah, we just practice only. Uh. I spend some time on this question. After that, you can leave. Uh. You may leave. For those who don't have this lecture, don't have this tutorial session, you can actually leave immediately. Uh, if you don't want to do this, at least you also have other things to do. So let's uh, do this for uh, maybe half an hour, then you can leave. I will leave you to do your own revision here. Uh, let's describe the M star law. Anyone also can join in and then uh, put your Answers over here. Yeah. After that, we will discuss the answers. Do I know who has done this uh, A? The performance uh, describe the M star law. The performance improvement to be gained from using some faster mode of execution is limited by the fraction of the time of the faster mode can be used. Ah, correct, very good. Yeah, let's see a big round of to the students. Uh. Okay, may I know who wrote this uh, answer? Who we'll write this answer? Okay, very good. Yeah, correct. Ah, uh, Yen Chang, ah, uh. Yen Chang, thank you. So very good.
So speed up equals to performance for entire task using enhancement that uh, possible uh, over the performance of the entire task uh, without using the enhancement. Yeah. Okay, very good. It's correct. Yeah, you're right. So thank you, Yen Chan, for doing this. Okay, very good. Let's give a big round of applause to Yen Chan. So you get your six marks uh, if it's come up in your exam question. So the performance uh, improvement to be gained from using some faster mode is limited by the fraction of the time of the faster mode can be used. The next one is a speed up equals to uh, this one. Performance the entire task using enhancement when possible. So, correct, very good. So, let's do the second part. For second part, uh, yeah, this will be the question. You have a system that contains a special processor, something like this. So, let's do it. Uh, then, yeah, let's try to do this. Uh, again, Chang again.
Okay, very good. Uh, Yin Chang has already done uh, over all speed up for this uh, using this fucking quad processor. This fifty percent of it uh, can be can use the fourteen quad processor. So speed up of the fourteen quad processor is fifteen times, so you get one point eight seven five. Very good. So let's see a bit of confidence. So you can continue to calculate and find out the answer. He also correct. Very good. And last one, what fraction of computations should use the 13 point processor for an overall speed up of 2.25? Now you reverse engineering. Eh? Let's say you put 2.25, then you uh, calculate what is the fraction So Yen Chang, you can put your answer space if you want. Eh? So you copy here, then yeah, put here. You put at the next page, eh? because I know you don't have enough space already. For the tree, you can put over here.
It's Chong Yi, right? It's Chong Yi. Yeah, Chong Yi, thank you. So Chong Yi has done the third one, yeah? Okay. Should be correct as well, right? 2.25. Fifty nine, so two point two five is fifty nine, and then uh oh okay, around there lah okay lah, so it's correct lah, it's within the range. Yeah. Okay, very good. Let's give a start. So thank you, Chong Yi and Yan Chang. So uh we have done some revision for today, but I know uh it's already two hour plus ah. Huh? I know you all also quite tired already, and today is a quite hot day yeah yeah so. Uh, now I will leave you to do your own revision. You have question to ask, you can ask me. If you have no question, then you may leave the class. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. If you have no question, you may you are allowed to leave the class. Thank you very much. So if question, please stay back and then ask me any question because we have already finished our tutorial questions. Yeah. Just for you to do some revision, ask me question if you have. If not, then you may leave the class. Anyone has any question? Thank you, Han Dong. Thank you, Xu Pian, Yao Ting, uh, Wen Liang. So if no question, then uh, goodbye. Lah. And all the best. Lah. So thank you. Also, please prepare your presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, bye.